Hello everyone, you are welcome to today's session. We will continue with our series on the theme, The Value of Mentorship. I believe you had great lessons from the first part and that you have picked cues and nuggets of wisdom that will continually help you as you aim at improving your life and becoming a blessing to this generation and the generations that are after us. Before we continue, we would want to say a word of prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, we bless you for today. Thank you for granting to us, O Lord, the gift of life and for blessing us with the wisdom, O God, to number our days and live a life that is truly reflective of you. We pray for the grace to understand and move on, O God, and become all that you want us to become, even in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now, in, in the previous lesson, in the previous teaching, we examined the meaning of mentorship. What a mentor is, or who a mentor is, who a mentee is, and the reason why mentorship is very, very important especially in a world that seems to be ignoring the need for learning amongst a young generation. And we, we had a very interesting time understanding the essence of mentorship to this generation particularly and how by having mentors who are of sound character and have the results that are, are relevant to our grooming, uh, we, we can be able to attain all that God expects us to attain. And we, we considered a key thought from Mrs. Oprah Winfrey, who said a mentor is somebody that helps us to see the hope that is in us. So yes, indeed, we have established that mentorship is truly uh, important and valuable. And if we are able to tap into this all-important key, we will become the best that God expects us to become. Today, we want to consider certain key scriptures and we'll learn from some uh, relevant uh, people and also consider the case of Jesus as a mentor to the disciples. And three key scriptures will guide our discussion today. Uh, Mark chapter 3 verse 13 to 17, Proverbs chapter 4 verse 20 to 22, and 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 1. And when we read, when we read Mark chapter 3 verse 13 to verse 15, the scripture helps us to understand that Jesus went up into the mountain and called to himself those whom he would, and they came to him. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses, and to cast out devils. So Jesus went up the mountain to pray, and after praying, after having a discussion with God concerning his life and his purpose, he called some people to himself and appointed 12 to be with him so that he can train these ones and later send them out to also fulfill the same thing that he was doing. Preaching the gospel, casting out the devils, healing the sick and helping the oppressed and all. So this is Jesus, the mentor, calling to himself people that he wanted to train. Now, when we go to Proverbs chapter 4, Proverbs chapter 4, the verse 20, the Bible says, My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ears unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. The last scripture, Second Timothy chapter 2, the verse 1 and 2. 
Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me amongst many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So we see a certain line of thought in these three scriptures. We see Jesus calling to himself many whom he willed and choosing twelve that would be with him and that he can send later to go out and preach and do all uh, the other things that we know about. And in Proverbs chapter 4 verse 20 to 22, we find a counsel that is telling uh, us to incline our ears to his sayings. Uh, paying attention to his words and that if we find the words that he speak it will be life unto us and to our flesh and then when we come to second timothy chapter 2 the verse 2 paul speaking to his disciple timothy tells him that the things that thou hast heard of me amongst many witnesses confirming the need to pay attention to the words of the mentor he says that commit same to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also so without a certain attention without a certain being with without a certain inclining of our ears to the teachings and instructions of a mentor we wouldn't be able to commit same to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also in second timothy chapter 2 verse 2 we see the transgenerational effect of mentorship where a mentor is able to groom and the mentee is able to pay attention unto instruction and learn to the point where the mentor can trust him to commit all that he has learned from he, the mentor, to others who can also pass it on. So in mentorship, there is the key of passing it on to the next generation. So once there are people that are willing to submit amongst the many witnesses, submitting to the instructions of a mentor somebody who has attained the results that are relevant in the dealings that we have been called to the same things that the person has been able to transfer and pour into us as a mentor we will also be able to replicate even better grooming others to also pass it on just like a marathon mentorship is a key that needs to be engaged at a level where we, 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 we understand that there is a baton that needs to be passed on and therefore we must be ready as a younger generation to take on that baton and as an older generation to pass on that baton, passing it on well so that the, the next generation does not miss it because we didn't pass it on well and also receiving it well by positioning ourselves strategically as the young ones to be able to take and move on to pass it on to the next generation so in these three scriptures we see a, a certain need for being with a mentor or being with somebody that will train us and listening to their counsel, paying attention to their instruction and getting groomed consciously by them and then being able, because we have been trained properly, to pass it on to the next generation. So true mentorship is like apprenticeship, just like somebody who is undergoing training to become a tailor, a mechanic, a carpenter, or a seamstress or whatever you can think about the more committed and focused the apprentice is to learning and the more committed the master is also in teaching and grooming this apprentice the easier and faster it takes or it becomes for the apprentice to become a master or a better uh, person in that particular field of work the bible says in luke chapter 6 the verse 40 a pupil is not above his teacher but everyone after he has been fully trained 
will become like his teacher. So it is important that there's a certain high level of commitment and focus from either ends as a mentor focusing your energy on grooming that particular person in your department in whatever uh, area that you find yourself grooming that person to be able to become a reflection of yourself because you would you should understand that there will be a time where you need to have produced somebody after your kind that is the essence of our humanity when god created adam and eve one thing that he told them is to reproduce to be fruitful and multiply so the mentality we should have as people that are taking the lead is that we should be able to be fruitful and that is the key in mentorship being fruitful means being able to pour into others and becoming a, a channel through which others can be produced and so commitment is required from the mentor focus is required from the mentor and all the more important commitment is required from the student or the mentee and focus as well because as we are focused and committed to the process of becoming better through the grooming of a mentor we will become like the teacher or even become better if there is indeed proper mentorship or apprenticeship soon the master will not be felt when he is absent so where there is where there is a proper mentorship and proper grooming it gets to a point where in that workplace the absence of the master will not be so much felt why because the student or students the mentees have so learned from the master who is now able to produce results that are similar in value as the master. So the student becomes a reflection of the master so that when the master is not around and a car is brought to the workshop, the student is able to work on it to the level that the master can be proud and say, yes, indeed, you have become a reflection of myself. It's unfortunate that in many organizations and departments, there is no proper mentorship system in, in our religious environment, in our Christian setting. The, the concept of discipleship is not being properly um, undertaken because a lot of us are not willing to learn and many are not ready to spend their time training and grooming others. We seem to be so busy uh, and unable to reproduce after our own kind. So we say in theory that discipleship is very important, but the people to spend the time in grooming are not available and the students are not willing to learn. Such is the unfortunate situation that we find ourselves. We, we glean from the account of Elijah and Elisha, whom we talked about in the previous video, that Elisha followed through with Elijah until the point where Elijah realized that this boy has given so much to learn from me, has given so much to go the extra mile with me, to serve me and honor me. So I need to ask him what he wants because nobody should be able to follow me or any great person to such a level without having received anything from that great person. So Elisha received a double portion because he was ready to learn, ready to serve and go the extra mile. Elisha, who was a farmer, became a great prophet because he submitted as an apprentice to the great prophet of God, Elijah. There were others who were called the sons of the prophet. They, they were students of Elijah, but they were not able to receive of the, 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 the full strategy and mantle of Elijah the prophet because they were afar and they were not able to draw near to be with Elijah as Jesus did by calling the twelve to be with him. And so they missed out on the double portion. Peter and co fishermen tax collectors and the like became men who turned their worlds upside down and whose influence still remain today because they follow through 
with thorough mentorship and apprenticeship under Jesus Christ until his character was formed in them. One influential figure that I, I follow so much, Jim Ron, speaks often in his audios, uh, in his engagements and all, about his teacher or his mentor who helped him to set goals as an undecided, bankrupt, married young man who didn't really know how to go about his life. So with one encounter with this man, he, he was able to meet somebody who became his teacher teaching him and mentoring him in setting goals and bringing out his fullest potential until he became a great, wealthy, and influential figure. Who is your mentor? Who are you consciously learning from in your workplace, in your academic journey, in your marriage life, in your professional development? Which books of great men and women are you learning from zealously and patiently until you become a reflection of their value and substance? These are key questions we should be asking ourselves at this point, understanding and appreciating the value of conscious, consistent mentorship. Now, the concept and process of mentorship is reflected in the biblical process of discipleship. When you read Matthew 28 from the verse 19 to 20, Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have taught you. So in this particular account of scripture, we find that in the process of discipleship or in mentorship, as is the case, we, we do not become by chance. We become because somebody has decided to make us. It's just like how we would make a pot uh, of clay. So we, 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 we do not just look at the, the clay and pick it up and all of a sudden, but just by looking at it or admiring it, it becomes a beautiful pot of clay, uh, a cup, a mug that is of expensive uh, value. No, it takes somebody to patiently mold and make that clay into a valuable substance. So in discipleship, Jesus said there is a making, making of a person. And so in mentorship too, we do not become just because we, we, we see somebody and admire the person for the results that they produce, but because we have submitted ourselves to allowing them to mold and make us listening and heeding to their instructions and helping ourselves by following through with them. So Jesus says, go and make disciples. And he said something that is very instructive teaching them to observe all that I have taught you. So in the moment that Jesus was leaving, remember in Mark chapter 3, the Bible says he brought them to himself so that they can be with him. He will teach them and send them out to proclaim. So at this point, Jesus was so much confident that he had mentored and groomed these ones taught them enough so that the things that he had taught them, they could also be able to teach the disciples that they will be making. And this is consistent with what Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. So it is important what you are learning. It's important what you are being taught because that will in the end determine what you become. What, you, what is made of you at the end is dependent on the teachings and instructions that you receive. Therefore, as we reiterated in the first video or session, who mentors you and how you are mentored is very, very important. So mentorship is a process and men are made and produced out of a conscious, patient, time-taking process. Now, in Mark uh, chapter 3, verse 13 to 
15. Jesus set a great example for us regarding the value of true mentorship. And by the example he left for us throughout his experience with the disciples as a great mentor and leader, we can glean from his mentorship relationship with his disciples and pick valuable cues that can help in our rising. So now, what we pick, we can pick three key things from, from the account in Mark chapter 3, verse 13 to 15. There are lots that we can pick from there, but I would like to share with us three key things that we can pick from Mark 3, 13 to 15. The first one is the specificity of mentorship. The specificity of mentorship. Now, although Jesus called many to himself, only 12 were granted the privilege of being thoroughly mentored at close range. Yes, so Jesus had a lot of people that he called to himself. He says he called to himself the people that he would. And from them, he chose 12 that they will be with him and that he would teach them and send them out. So, yes, generally, there may be people that we admire and we follow. So, in our Christian setting, ministry, in our workplace, in wherever we find ourselves, there may be people that we look up to, our leaders, our pastors, our teachers, our heads of department, our lecturers and all. There may be people that we are looking up to generally, but there should be specificity when it comes to mentorship mentorship is not a general adventure so jesus chose 12 that they will be with him and that he can send them out to to preach and then uh, draw men to himself so similarly the apostle paul also had many children in the lord and these he told to imitate him as he also imitated christ however he thoroughly and much closely mentored individuals like timothy titus onesimus so that they can take after him and become a reflection of he himself as he imitates christ when he is no longer around so timothy was the most pronounced of them all as we find in the scriptures and in second timothy 2 verse 1 and 2 which we read early on he told timothy to be able to reproduce all the things that has been produced in him by he paul so this emphasizes the need for specificity in choosing who mentors you as a mentee and who you mentor as a mentor so we cannot mentor everybody yes we can have a lot of people following us but there should be people that we call to ourselves as jesus did and allow to stay with us that we can consciously train to become better people in a particular area and so when you also as a person looking out for a mentor you don't accept the fact that there are a lot of people that you are learning from and all there should be specific people that you you consciously and consistently allow to groom you so within your inner circle you can find somebody maybe at your department somebody who has sound character and who has a reflection of the results that you aim for who can can train you and advise you so that in your in your aim or 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 quest to become better in that particular position this person can be your source of instruction and advice it is very important so that we don't end up becoming general people but we become specific people who are specifically growing and becoming better the second key we can pick from this scripture is that mentorship or discipleship as we would take it takes fellowship time and rigorous training men do not become great or become better than their teachers or like their mentors or teachers by just casually learning from the great people that are in their circle they walk into greatness by spending time closely and consistently with visionary mentors who have proven results fellowship is very important in the 
process of mentorship, that you build a relationship with your mentors. And this relationship, if, if, if you would, uh, have the person not physically available to be uh, uh, able to engage with how you you spend time in one of my 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 articles on the value of reading squeezing out your full potential we talked about the need for consistent reading and how you can be mentored through the books and video seminars that great people have following closely reading 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 listening 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 just as i did with dr mouse muro and i've seen the evidence of such training and mentorship through his books his uh, teaching sessions and all that i have been following closely over the years so it takes fellowship and i have people within my circle in, in my department in my ministry, people that have gone ahead of me. Yes, I follow and learn from a lot of people, but there are specific people that I go to, specific people that I, I, I ask questions about, people that I engage in particular areas that I believe they can help me to grow. They have become my mentors and I get to them and they engage me and consciously I have realized that these are people that have an interest in me and believe in my potential and therefore are personally uh, helping me to grow. The, so fellowship is very important. You have to spend time with the people you have to spend time with them and allow them to mentor you so they if they are people that have books you read their books if they are people that uh, organize seminars and all you go for their seminars you help them you serve them you honor them so that they begin to see you more as a son as an apprentice that they can grow uh, into a better person the third that we can pick from this particular scripture is that there is an expected end to proper mentorship. So there's a goal for every mentorship process. So you don't generally follow people, but then there should be a goal. What do you want to get at the end of your mentorship process? Although there's really no end to mentorship. So, but then you should have a vision. You should have a goal. There should be a goal that is guiding the process of training or apprenticeship that you are going through. Just like in any apprenticeship uh, process, a carpentry uh, workshop, the, the student's goal is that at the end of maybe three years, I should become a master in carpentry so that I can also set up my carpentry workshop and all that we can think about. So Jesus had a goal in mind when he called and appointed the 12 disciples to be with him. And his goal was to teach them and send them out to proclaim, cast out demons, heal the sick, etc., so we find that in, in, in his calling of the 12, in the appointment of the 12, we see that it was clearly spelled out that the goal was to teach them to go out to proclaim, cast out demons and heal the sick. So if your supposed mentorship process has no clear goal or end in mind, then you are bound to make very little from it. You may benefit from that grooming, uh, but in the end, because there's no goal, you, you may not get much from it. The Bible says that where there's no vision, the people cast off restraint. So once the vision is clearly spelt, spelt out, Habakkuk chapter 2, he says, write down the vision, make it plain, so that whoever sees it can pick it up and run with it. So the goal or vision of that discipleship or mentorship or apprenticeship uh, process has to be very clear. Having a clear goal in mind keeps both the mentor and mentee focused on attaining the specific crown or end that has been set. So these are three key things that we pick from Mark chapter 3 verse 13 down to 15 from Jesus, our chief uh, mentor and master. Now, moving on, one instructive point that we can glean from the verse 16 and 17 of Mark chapter 3 is the privilege of having a personalized name 
or identity with the mentor. What do we mean by this? Now, when we go to that particular portion of the Mark chapter 3, we find that amongst the 12 that Jesus appointed, he gave a name to Simon. It's quite interesting that Jesus gave names personally to Peter, James, and John. He gave the name Peter, which means the rock, to Simon, and nicknamed James and John Buanegis, which also means the sons of thunder. The fact that these three ended up being the closest to Jesus and thus having the privilege to partake in the most extraordinary and secret experiences of Jesus is quite telling compared to the other 12 and all the other people that may have been disciples of Jesus. At the Mount of Configuration, the three were there in his experience before his death. He called the three and sent them along to help him to pray. So in most of the key experiences, Jesus took along these three. And so it is very uh, interesting to understand why these people uh, became an anchor around Jesus even amongst the 12. Your mentor may not change your name, but the level of hunger and learning spirit that you demonstrate will grant you the privilege of having access to their most secret experiences and strategies. I am a personal beneficiary of this, where I have been been privileged to learn from certain experiences that my mentors do not tell others and they are able to expose you to certain things that they do not expose others that may be following them within uh, the department or within the ministry or wherever you find out yourself so they wouldn't mind taking you up on the mountains of transcript Figuration. In the moments where they, they wouldn't expect everybody or anybody to be around, because you have built such a rapport with them in service and honor, they, they have a special place for you within their hearts and they have a special identity that they have accorded to you such that you will benefit from them greatly than all others. So it is important how we build a rapport with our mentors, how we, we show a demonstration of learning, a spirit of learning, following through until the point where we have the privilege of a personalized name or identity with our mentor. That is very important to gain from the true full value of mentorship. And now um, it's... It's amazing how Jesus went about his mentorship experience with the disciples. And within three and a half years, he was able to train them, groom them by keeping them with him, teaching them how to pray, teaching them how to do A, B, C, and D, casting out devils, teaching and rightly dividing the word of truth and all. The results were profound and remain profound even to our time. In Acts chapter 4 verse 13, we find the evidence or outcome of their having spent ample time with Jesus as disciples under tutorship and mentorship. The scripture says in Acts chapter 4 verse 13, But seeing the boldness of Peter and John, and perceiving that they were unlearned and uneducated, they marveled, that is the Pharisees and the others, and they recognized them that they had been with Jesus. Confirming Mark chapter 3, the verse 13 to 15, how Jesus called them to be with him. Summing up, it says, And beholding the man who was healed standing with them, they could not say anything against it. So the disciples were so much transformed through their mentorship experience with Jesus that the results that were produced out of them were, were authentic and could not be disproved. Such great transformation that comes from true, conscious, consistent mentorship. The product of being with him 
through mentorship is that these uneducated and unlearned men began to produce uncommon results that men couldn't reject the authenticity and valuableness of their results. How long have you stayed with your mentor? Do you even have a godly and strategic mentor at all or mentors at all? There was a time in the scriptures where the disciples struggled to cast out just a demon from a little boy. Yet, when they became of age in their apprenticeship experience under Christ, their results became a reflection of their master. With so much ease and simplicity, they wrought many signs and wonders. They spoke just like Jesus. That is the value of mentorship. If you would submit to proper grooming, under strategic, sound, and relevant uh, individuals that have taken a step ahead, that have the results that you aim for, the, the result will be that you will become a reflection of them. And just as the scripture earlier proposed, if the student is properly trained, he will become just like the master. So that is something I want us to pick up from the accounts concerning Jesus' mentorship or discipleship experience, how we can pick cues from there and be able to make our mentorship experience more valuable and more effective and more beneficial to us in the overall fulfillment of our potential as uh, individuals in whatsoever field of life that we find ourselves, in our career, in our relationships, in our professional development, in academia, and all that we can think about. Mentorship is very, very important. Concluding, when you submit thoroughly to mentorship in whatsoever field or endeavor that you find yourself, what you are doing really is that you are tapping into the rewards that come with the mentor sacrifices and experience in life. When you submit to proper apprenticeship or grooming, you are submitting to the toils and sacrifices that back the extraordinary results and influences that these great men and mentors command. You are really saying, I am on a journey towards fulfilling purpose and living out my fullest potential. And I believe that you have the results and experiences that warrant my conscious and submissive learning. For this course, I choose to submit to your tutelage. I choose to be present for every seminar you hold or recommend as much as is possible with me. I choose to read and listen to your materials and those that you recommend to me as your mentee. Because I am certain that they can build me up just as they have done to you. I am ready to learn from your mistakes and the strategies that have kept you rising. I do so because I know and acknowledge and honor the results that you express. I want to be trained until I become just like you so that people can look at me and say, indeed, you have been with this particular mentor. Find a sound, visionary, and purpose-driven mentor who will groom you in your quest to become all that God wants you to become in life. God is indeed the builder of everything, yet every house is built by someone. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 4 helps us to know. So therefore, allow God to build and groom you through men and women of proven character and valuable results. Uh, I believe as we give ourselves wholly to being taught and groomed and as we allow ourselves as people who have attained certain results of value to train others and groom them, we'll be able to build a better generation now and going forward so that the impact that we have as individuals will be transgenerational, that will become people of substance and value, that will not get to a point where there are no new persons who can take over from the old, so that as the, 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 
the Elijahs are passing by, there will be a certain Elisha to take over from them. As the Mount Muros are leaving, there will be others that can take over from them. As the Nelson Mandela's are leaving, there will be certain people that can take over from them because mentorship has been fully and truly engaged. In your small area, in your your key field of study or career choose and find somebody that can groom you and as somebody who is already attaining onto certain levels find people young ones that you can also train and help to attain the best that god expects of them and together we can become god's best in this world and attain onto the fullest potential multiplying and being fruitful in all that we do. God bless you so much for spending time today with us on this channel. And I hope to see you in the next audio, in the next video, God willing, uh, as we, we sum up with the third part of this series on the value of mentorship. Stay safe and the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen.